Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno. Proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. I feel like I'm about to have the time of my life. I'm jumping out of an airplane over the Las Vegas Valley. All right, a little nervous. You come on the day with no wind, the flowers are out, the butterflies are here. The first time I've seen them here this year, so you, the timing couldn't have been better. I hike up Mount Charleston to meet some very special locals. Believe it or not, a lot of the history and the mystery of the Mojave Desert lives underground. I'm off-roading through the Mojave in search of history and adventure. You can never have too much garlic, butter, bacon. Oh, and cheese. cheese. And cheese. And cheese. cheese. Yeah. And the Dutch Divas dishing up some delicious food for camping. Yeah. What a rock. I'm John Burke. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. And I'm on a mission to show you the one-of-a-kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. One of the best ways to see Nevada is from the air. For some, that view comes by way of climbing, or ballooning, or perhaps looking out of an airplane's window. Then, there are those who actually jump out of the plane. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm an adventure sport addict. Today, I'm skydiving at Skydive Las Vegas. This isn't my first jump, and I'm sure it won't be my last. Gara. Hey, John, how are you doing? I'm great, how are you? <laughs> great. Man, it's early, but this place is packed. Yeah, you know, we're pretty busy on a general basis. People love to skydive, and this is where they come to do it. What do you see in terms of people's faces coming in and then when they leave? Well, it's Vegas, so it's usually pretty early in the morning. They're tired, <laughs> uh, mixed with you know a little bit of fear, um, sometimes people are very quiet when they're nervous, but then when they come down, it's like a different person completely. Like the person that walked in that door is not the person that's leaving. Their life has just changed completely. Kara is describing my first jump experience perfectly. My life was, indeed, changed forever. Tell me about your first time jumping. I was terrified the whole way up, very quiet, but the minute I left that airplane, the fear was gone. The second I touched down, I wanted to go right back up, and I did. I never stopped skydiving after that very first time. Mike Bertrand is a skydiving instructor with over 6,000 jumps, and today, he's in charge of keeping me safe. Man, this place is like a machine. What's going a, on out here? It's a well-oiled machine. So out here, we're going to get you all suited up, ready to go. We're going to put you in a harness. One size fits no one. <laughs> we're going to also put a harness on you. Get you all suited up and ready to rock. And these guys obviously are, are packing the They're shoots. They're packing all the parachutes, yep. Well, how many jumps do you do a day? We'll do anywhere from one to 15 jumps. It depends how many of you guys show up. Uh, you know, if we get 100 people, we're going to jump 100 people, and I might do 15 jumps in that day. Mike runs through a quick orientation with this flight's nervous new jumpers. Heels in line with your butt, toes point toward the sky. Ideally, we slide in our heels and our butts at the same time, safe and sound. Good. After learning the basics, Mike gets me suited up. All right, it's the latest in fall fashion, okay? Uh, it looks like you. I'm part of a bad 80s new wave band. Or that you just escaped <laughs> from a correctional institution. Yeah. Whatever way. Do you have anything in blue? <laughs> Mike introduces me to the plane. It's fine with one small issue. That's a bird without a door. <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need doors. <laughs> All right, give me one second to get situated. You're going to sit right in between my legs. All right. It doesn't take long to get in and get going. Spots on the ground designated, depending on where the wind is coming. One in the pack. We're about halfway 
me up. I don't feel nervous. I feel like I'm about to have the time of my life. All right, a little nervous. Sometimes you just gotta step back and get a bigger perspective. <laughs> All right, man. How'd you like that, dude? Oh! <laughs> oh, man! Well done, brother. That was the best one ever. Oh, yeah. Woo! There's really only one way to explore outdoor Nevada. You got to get after it. You got to get out and you got to do this. What he said. Dude, that's <laughs> awesome. Great job, John. Oh. There are many unique things about Nevada, but did you know that we have our very own species of butterflies? Today I'm hiking in the Spring Mountains, and to you and I, it represents absolutely beautiful scenery, and it is. But to scientists and researchers, it represents a sort of ecological island and home to the Spring Mountain Dark Blue Butterfly. The Spring Mountain Dark Blue Butterfly has adapted and survived in this area for more than 12,000 years. Dan, nice to see you up here on the mountain. Good morning, John. How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome to our prime Spring Mountains dark blue butterfly habitat. You having any luck finding here, some here today? You, your entire crew is charmed. You've come on the day with no wind, the flowers are out, the butterflies are here. The first time I've seen them here this year, so you, the timing couldn't have been better. Dan Thompson is a professor at UNLV and he has dedicated a lot of time to study this beautiful insect. It's interesting talking to you. I come here for butterflies and immediately you begin explaining the plant life. It's a direct relationship, huh? That's absolutely correct. Every single butterfly in the entire West, but particularly these, has a, either a single plant or a several plants that chemically are just right for their caterpillars to eat. And it's, it's literally the plant that sets everything else for the butterfly's life cycle. The species survival directly relates to the perseverance of a plant called sulfur buckwheat. How many of these butterflies then are around here? The actual individuals of the species. Yes. Well, we could probably find several hundred on this hillside right now if we looked carefully. Thompson photographs the insect's life stages, from mating rituals to the female laying an egg on the sulfur buckwheat plant. And from the egg to the caterpillar stage, the plant is a food source for the caterpillar. Within a few weeks, it retreats into the soil and transforms into the pupa stage. A year later, the butterfly emerges if you think about it, it's a legacy of a butterfly that went all the way back to the Pleistocene and earlier when this woodland that we're in on the mountain slopes here stretched across the valley floor down by Tule Springs over to the east here where there were mammoth and giant ground sloths. This butterfly almost certainly was much more widespread then and it's literally a lineage that's ancient 
here. Thank you so much. What a, what a joy. What a pleasure to talk to you. All right, I'm going to go talk to your buddy, Corey. Corey Kallstrom is a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Corey, my question for you is more about the landscape. Tell me about this as an ecological island. What does that mean? How did that happen? Well, the Spring Mountains is a, called a sky island. And what that means is that back in the times of the Pleistocene, and as the climate started to warm up, this place became isolated. So it's sort of an island in the middle of a desert. And it's a unique area just because of the unique life forms that occur here. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is planning to conduct a study on this butterfly's status, which could ultimately mean new protections for it. Why would the average person care about this beautiful little blue butterfly in the middle of this island? Why, why, do, why do we care? Well, we should care because the butterflies provide us with an indication of what's going on in the broader environment. When things go wrong in the environment and some of our uh, unique species, whether it's this butterfly or any other species, it tells us that something's going on in the environment that we should be concerned about. Mm. Corey and I finally spot one of the rare butterflies. Right there on that areogonum underneath that sagebrush. You see it right in front of you on the other side towards me? The yellow, yep, I see him. I see him. Now that I've spotted the star of this story, I want to know more about its connection to the land. This is C.J. Woodard, a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service. Yeah, I was just talking to the guys, and, and one thing I was taken from it is the just the fragility of this butterfly system. What can you tell me about land management out here and how that ties into the whole thing? Well, us as a land management agency, we, we're, we manage for multiple uses. So I, we manage for OHV users, hikers, campers, whoever wants to come out and kind of use the land. The butterfly, um, it, it's incorporated in every decision and in every action that we take. So people that come out here and use this land, who are they? Are they the locals and do they know about this system here? It's probably most of our locals um, from Cold Creek or um, anybody maybe from the west side from Corral who know about this area. And, and what would you like them to know if they come out here and use this area? When you come out here and you walk around and you see plants like these lying around, um, just walk, try to walk from walk, rock to rock and be on bare soil and just be cognizant of what you're doing and, and how you could be having an effect on the environment. They don't know, but do you know why they call them butterflies? I have no clue either. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you for everything that you do out here. It really does matter to everybody and I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Thank you for taking interest in the species. Absolutely. Taking an interest in the species is no small matter because what happens here in this species affects the greater and it can affect humanity down the road in ways we don't even know. It's called the butterfly effect for good reason. The Mojave Desert harbors a rich history. Here, dotted across the dusty landscape, are a number of old Nevada towns that have faded into obscurity. Today, I'm headed out to visit some of them. I'm taking an off-road history tour. One of the advantages of off-roading is that you can see hidden gems you wouldn't find any other way. Now, today we're in the Mojave Desert in a tiny little town, tiny, called Sema, and we're meeting up with Rick Nelson. He knows all about this area. Rick Nelson. Hi, John. How are you, sir? Good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, finally. So listen, I know I'm in the Mojave, uh -huh. but that's all I know. Can you tell me more? Well, uh, yes. Actually, you're at a train depot. Train depots were uh, dotted the lines of the old railroads back in the day when every five miles they had to refuel or, or resupply. This is a rare gem because a lot of them over time have either been the wood that was left over, the structures were either taken away uh, by vandals, um, burned for campfires, or just let to rot. For some reason, uh, people let this one stay and uh, we get to see the character of what they actually looked like back in the day. This is the general store and post office. And if you look in the window, you actually see an old wanted poster. It's a time capsule. I mean, this is the way it was 100 years ago. Exactly. SEMA is too close to civilization for Rick. He's going to take me even further out in the middle of nowhere. So John, we're closing in on the next depot. We've done about 20 miles. And remember how I told you that every five miles from the depot, yeah. there was nothing there between the last one and this one. They just can sometimes just disappear. That's like banishing American history. It is. We stop at the Kelso Depot Visitor Center. My attention's immediately drawn to the abandoned post office. John, this is one of the reasons I do this. There's just so many great things you find every day. Things like this, a post office in the middle of the desert. But you gotta get off the beaten path. 
You can't Absolutely. stay in your hotel room. You gotta get out and explore. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Let's go to the big building. I wanna see the big the depot. depot, yep. Founded by Union Pacific in 1862, the Kelso Depot is now a museum. During its heyday in the 1940s, this place was home to about 2,000 people and ran three shifts a day, 24-7. So this is where the people got their tickets and they could send out telegraphs. And if you look through this window, you look real close, you can almost see them walking around in their old time clothing and their hats. And this depot operated from 1924 through 1985. And people could sleep in this depot. Yeah, mostly employees. And we'll show you those rooms upstairs. Let's go. I want to see that. So this side is one of the depot workers' rooms. Notice they have their own sink and their own toilet. And they even have the Union Pacific logos on the beds. At the start of the 20th century, Trains were the primary mode of motorized land transportation. At the time, the U.S. had a steam railroad network of almost 200,000 miles. You could spend the entire day here soaking in the atmosphere. Rick had yet another off the main road site to show me. Welcome to the Death Valley Mining Camp. There is so much to see here, John, you won't believe it. I already don't believe it. <laughs> Where are we gonna start? Well, this is the housing area and then the mines over there. Let's start the mine. Let's go. Okay. The say is the main op mining operation was 1899 to 1902. Every few decades, a new group of miners try their luck with newer equipment and methods of extraction. So, this is a diesel engine, for instance, and it still has the uh, number plate on it, serial number and all that. From this, what year would this have been? This is the 30s, late 30s. So this is somebody coming back years yes. later because and I said, hey, they found some stuff here. Let's see if we can go deeper. Correct. So here's the, the, the mill area. They would take from the mine the raw material grind it up in this crusher, and the fine material would come out, and they would, uh, like, pan it, if you will, but in a large scale. Then Rick and I walk over to the actual mine, and I was shocked by what I saw there. Oh, my God. Wow. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. That will give you the heebie-jeebies. It makes your knees weak. Now, normally, the government will come in and either fill it with cement, rocks, or a gate over it. This place has been untouched by anybody. Soon we leave the mine area and head off to the next site. After a bit of a hike, we come upon an old home standing alone in the vast desert. So this is the gem of the entire property. Wow, it's in good condition. This house has been abandoned for probably at least 80, 85 years. Look at the tin roof. Wow. Isn't this awesome? Wow, it's like... Uh, Really well. Like nothing's style. happened in here. I mean, it's just completely time has stood still. Yep. I mean, you could live in this today. Well, tomorrow with a little sweeping. Yep. Cloth covered wiring and porcelain brackets suggest this home was built in the 1930s. Oh my Watch gosh. Watch yourself. Here's the door. We're going to the cooler. 20 degrees cooler. Here's where they kept cold stuff because they'd have refrigerators back then. All the perishables were under here. Mm hmm. You can see this, how this all worked and what kind of life this was. And you know when it was a hot day, they would just come down here and say, <laughs> it's 100 degrees outside, but it's only 80 in here. Oh my gosh, this structure is incredible, completely huh? completely in place. Everything is solid. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Look at the breeze coming through that big window there. It's stark, it's creepy, but it's beautiful. How many people lived here? It seems like a big family to me and the boss of the mine. That's my guess. If these walls could talk, what do you think they'd say? Watch me. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. Abandoned post offices, abandoned mines in the middle of the Mojave, towns that are no longer here. Nevada just keeps giving up her secrets. There's so much to learn and explore, and I'm glad you're along for the ride on Outdoor Nevada. There is nothing like cooking outdoors, and for hundreds of years, people have used Dutch ovens to do it. Here in Nevada, Dutch ovens are still in the spotlight, and that's why we're spending time with the Dutch Diva. Hey, hey Terry. How's it going, John? Andy, Great good to, to see, see you. you. How's everything? Good. How's life on the road? Oh, you, boy, it's always good? good to come How to a place called... Good. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Oh, it's oh, always oh, nice yeah. to come to paradise and get some fresh air and see friendly people. So, Terry, you're the Dutch diva. Everybody around here knows that, so I know you've got something up your sleeve today. What are we doing? Yeah, we're going to try a traditional great camping dish. We're going to make some beef stew, and we're going to supplement that. We're going to make my famous um, 
pumpkin rosemary biscuits to go with it. Terry, I love you. Yeah. I've always loved you. Beef stew and biscuits, the quintessential campfire meal. Can't wait to see the Dutch diva spin on this one. Well, let's get started. Okay, so Randy's gonna get a pot going over there. We've got some hot coals. We're gonna sear this in some olive oil. Okay. okay? You can go ahead and throw that meat in there. Okay. So what we're gonna add to our meat is I have a mixture here of some fresh herbs and garlic, rosemary, basil. Take a smell of that. It's heavenly. So we're gonna dump our herbs in there. Mm -hmm. And you've got garlic. Got well, garlic. Yes. That's your thing, isn't it? Yeah. You can never have too much garlic. Butter, bacon. Oh, and cheese. cheese. And cheese. And cheese. cheese. Yeah. A stew's not really complete without some good, hearty vegetables. I want the vegetables a little bit larger. Why is that? Um, because you don't want them to get too mushy. Oh, okay. Yeah. The beauty of the Dutch oven is there's always room for one more ingredient. Sun-dried tomatoes is kind of something that um, my daughter actually turned me onto a beef stew recipe that she uses that has sun-dried tomatoes. And my mom was real big on adding some of this um, instant onion soup mix. Yeah, add some kind of richness to the broth. So I'm gonna put a little bit of that in there. Well, see, I like what you just said. My daughter said this, so-and-so said this, he likes this. It's just whatever you wanna put yeah, in there. Yeah, and what I found is that a lot of my recipes I got from somebody that then I played with and made it my own. Okay. Especially to make it suitable for a Dutch oven. The broth, I knew we were getting to the broth. Yeah, so we wanna add some beef broth. All right. Now we're gonna add some um, burgundy. What does that do? I don't know. <laughs> now what we're gonna do okay. is put the lid on it okay. and add some top coals. This dish is great for beginners. You don't need to be too precise when placing your coals. What do you say we make some biscuits? Do your thing, we'll be back. Okay. While the stew cooks, we get started on our dry ingredients for the biscuits. We're going to take this butter and we're going to cut it into our dry ingredients. Okay, am I done, am I good? Yeah, that's good. You okay. wanna just get a crumbly mixture. Now we have some pumpkin. Oh, put so that just, in? Yeah, just dump that in there. And how much is this? That's about say? two cups of pumpkin. And of course, we need some rosemary in our rosemary pumpkin biscuits. So we're going to grease that oven. We want to grease it really liberally. And why, because it adds flavor and it keeps it? adds it flavor, it keeps it from sticking, and in my opinion, it helps to season the oven. How's that? Okay, now you pass the course. I passed. So I'm gonna just kind of work this together. There's a little bit of flour at the bottom of the bowl that we want to work in. Now we have to dust the board and roll out the dough. I just use like cookie cutters. I like making creative ones. And then I'm gonna have you set these into our pot. That's what it looks like and is you can see she really, you get these in tight, right? You get them in tight because then as they rise, they really puff up. Between the biscuits and the stew, this campsite smells awesome. As soon as I can smell things, that tells me now I want to look at it and see how is it cooking and do I need to adjust my heat. Okay. And lift it up. I really like the way that looks. I don't think we need to do much except we're going to add just a little bit more heat on the top of that. So okay. go ahead and replace that lid. We've been cooking for over an hour and it's time to check on our dishes. All right, John, you want to do the honors? And let's I do see like how it. that stew looks. Are we set? You're set, yeah. Oh, oh look at that. beautiful. Man, that looks delicious. And Just this. perfect. Oh, and the aroma. Lid lifter and let's unveil our pumpkin rosemary biscuits. Oh, look, look at, at the that. Color. That is camping. That is cooking when you're out yeah. on the range, outdoor Nevada. That's how you eat. Moment of truth. Does it taste as good as it looks? A lot of this is really trial and error. So you're gonna have some failures along with some successes, mm -hmm. but that's how you learn and that's how you hone your skills. What do you think? I don't know if you know anything about failure. I don't believe you do. Uh. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah, this is one of my favorite bread recipes. I just think it's so delicious. Oh my gosh, all of it. Oh, that's exactly how I wanna eat. I don't know why people would ever do a breakfast bar unless 
they didn't know about this. Yeah, yeah. This definitely. has been fantastic. Thank you oh, so much. We're just so privileged to have you here. I am Thank so you. privileged to be here. Thank you very much, Thank sir. Thank you, sir. So the next time you're going to Outdoor Nevada, spending a little time out there, eat, eat well. Get yourself a Dutch oven, and you'll be in heaven. Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, inspiring the spirit of adventure with confidence in any terrain. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com.